Welcome to the archive. It's good to see you again, bud. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's good. Uh, good to see you again, too. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So uh, last time I saw you, it was like September 2021 and you were doing a promo for, uh, I think, it's Journey, the Journey West, is you called it? Uh, it was called a Garden Eastward. Garden Eastward. Okay. Close. Yeah. So so close with complete opposite direction, all that. <laughs> my my inability to remember names. Um, and so I was I was playing uh, one of the characters in the GoFundMe video, Augustine, um, and you're talking about some really cool stuff with the Wild West, the actual history to it, which I, like you, you got to fill me in a little more. Like it turns out. Hollywood was kind of off with the characters, like some of the people in it were, you know, in their like early 20s in the actual history. Like, like, tell me a little bit about this. I'm, I'm curious. The Wild West is such an interesting time period. It's a very weird time period from what I understand. And it's made by a lot of young people as well. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think, um, you, you know, the, the way that most people know about the Wild West nowadays is from movies. Um, that's, uh, you know, and that's partly why I wanted to become a filmmaker because I wanted to use myself as a, my, my experience as a historian to, um, show the past to people, because that's the main way that a lot of people learn about it. They don't really read tons of books. You know, they take classes in college, but, um, mostly people get their ideas from film and TV. Um, and Hollywood has projected this image of the wild west as being full of old men with gray beards and guns and scores to settle and everyone's mean and and grim and dark all the time and everything's just you know and, and it's it makes for very good movies it makes for very compelling stories but it doesn't always accurately reflect the what I've come to learn is the richness and diversity and uh, breadth of experience that the, the the actual American West had. Okay. All right. So let's get started with what is the time frame from what year to what year did the Wild West take place in? Um, I, th I mean, that's a great question. Uh, I think that most, I think that most people would say anywhere from between the 1820s, 1830s, uh, all the way through probably the early 1900s, uh, which would be from about the time of the, you know, the, the real, exp you know, Lewis and Clark's expedition, the Louisiana Purchase, um, all the way through probably the, you know, New Mexican statehood. And I think that was 1911, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, when they became states. Uh, those were, you know, that was basically when the West was tamed essentially you know that was that was that so so anytime between those periods is usually the what the west and movies people usually think of a time after the civil war 1865 uh through probably the 1890s that's where we get you know the cowboy hats and the spurs and the you know the 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 pump action. Pistols, the pump action shotguns and the and the leather dusters and the you know and galloping through the you know galloping through the sunset usually it's between 1865 and 1890 and uh, 1900 uh, so that's the period that we're dealing with right now all right so in the 1820s so you said the lewis and clark expedition and louisiana purchase so for people who may have forgotten their high school history or middle school history um could you give us at least a quick summary as to what those two events were uh so the louisiana purchase was the purchase of uh, a large, large amount of uh, what was once French territory uh, by uh, by the United States. Um, that happened in 1803. Um, uh, it was a time when, so that was about, you know, Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, uh, up through Montana. Uh, that was, you know, that was claimed by the by the French Republic. And uh, it was purchased uh, under the presidency of Thomas Jefferson, uh, and it was uh, th that. So you know that that didn't get us all the way, but you know other treaties uh, got us all the way to uh, the Pacific Ocean, and that's when you know 
when when that happened, that became kind of the the, the greatest extent of the United States at that time. Yeah, so uh, it's kind of like the first step through the door, or like the first domino. The first step through the door, because yeah, because we had you know the original thirteen colonies when we started off as a country. Uh, we gradually expanded down into Florida, uh, and you know we slowly were making treaties with Native American tribes and pushing them back gradually, gradually westward. Um, uh, there was the Trail of Tears under Andrew Jackson, where they were uh, they were basically packed up and sent to Oklahoma territory, Oklahoma territory, uh, which was called Indian Territory, um, and uh, those regions were you know, settled by white Americans. Um, the uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition was one of the first uh, major expeditions to explore this grand amount of territory that we had just uh, that we had just gotten um so and this and again this is a little bit earlier i say 1820s mostly because the the the, the period of you know the trappers and you know uh, people going westward probably st it, it started more around then but uh, nominally this this part of america this part of north america did belong to the united states at that time okay interesting <clears throat> so what was kind of the big kickoff for people to start migrating this way? And why was it? Because you said it was a younger demographic, primarily. Um, yes. Yeah. And so, yes, what, absolutely. Yeah. And so, what caused younger people to go out there? Uh, well, at the time, uh, you know, we're talking the uh, first, um, the first industrial revolution. Uh, so, we've got, you know, as we learned in school there's two industrial revolutions the second one which is the mass production and you know consumerism that happened later but the first industrial revolution uh was uh factories textile mills uh it was you know there were more people starting to move into cities because they realized they could get more money uh more consistently from working in a factory than say working on a farm because at the time america was Almost, was mostly agrarian, um, especially in the in the American South, but also in the North as well. Um, so what you had was a an increasingly urban society, uh, and uh, and uh, this feeling of this 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 feeling that there was opportunity out west. You know, there were you know because. In the original American territory, you know, there were laws, there were um, social norms that had to be followed. Uh, there were certain opportunities that people have, certain opportunities people were excluded from, depending on who they were and where they were from. And when all of this land was opened up, and I should also clarify, you know, this was inhabited land. This land did belong to, there were hundreds of thousands of Native American people that lived here. So when I say that, you know, this there was this big open tracts of land, I'm talking about from the perspective of the average American at the time. So what they saw was all this vast land that had just been opened up from the Louisiana Purchase, and they said, and it's all up for grabs. I, you, know, what, you, you mean that I don't have to work for a landlord? You know, uh, uh, you know I mean, I don't have to work in a factory? You mean I can just have my own thing my own plot of lands you know that that was that was part of what the original appeal of america was uh back in the 17th century when uh english people were saying you know i'm you know we're, we're living under this kind of feudalistic society uh we have only so many opportunities open to us you know you can go into the military at the church or law or be a farmer and you know if you don't inherit you got no land uh, because it was very difficult to buy it. So what you could do was say, I'm going to go to North America. I'm going to go to the colonies and I'm going to homestead. You know, I'm going to get a, a you know, purchase a, a tract of land for pennies on the dollar and I can have my own property. I can set myself up as my own landlord. Um, and the Louisiana Purchase allowed for vastly more territory where that same kind of life could be achieved so it was opportunity it was the idea of being your own person it was the idea of being independent and having 
something that was your own. I yeah, think so. And it was kind of like a, a a second chance. Like here it is. History was kind of repeating itself at this time, where the living land, the land that people were already living on had been too established that like you were basically going to be a factory worker or you're going to work for someone who owned a giant track of land. Yeah. And that was the, that was the case with a lot of people. And also, you know, there was a chance that you couldn't, you know, that you weren't going to inherit uh, all of your, all of your territory. There was a chance that you could lose your farm to someone else. Um, so this was a chance for people to say, I'm going to go out and find something new. I'm going to go, I'm going to go and I'm going to establish myself. Um, and if you're going to make this journey, this is, you know, this, this was early 19th century. They, this was a time before, uh, before steamboats. This was a time before, uh, locomotives. This is a time when it was literally, it was mo most of the, most of the Western world at this time was, it was, it was just, it was very backwards. You know, you, you had very little, um, you know, it was, a, you either walked or you was on, you were on a horse or you were on a boat or a ferry. And that was pretty much it. That was all you could do. And if you were going to make a huge journey like this, uh, uh, it, uh, you had to be in, you had to be in some sort of physical shape. You had to be healthy enough. Uh, to not, you know, easily fall prey to all the diseases that could, you know, you could fall prey to. Um, you had to be able to possibly defend yourself um, from wildlife, from Native Americans, from your fellow man. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that's kind of how this whole conversation got started is like, you know, the, the Wild West couldn't have been filled with old men because old men are not always the best kind of people to deal with these these journeys so you had young people who were at the beginning of their lives who were physically healthy enough to make the trip and who had the desire you know they, they you know they they didn't have a long life lived <clears throat> in the united states uh in, in in the united states proper uh where they had accumulated tons of land and tons of resources they wanted to strike out and get something of their own uh, and if they could just if they could just get there and they could just put in the hard work, they could do it. All right. So um, if like, let's just say like, you, you know, you and I were going to go out. And so we're both in our 20s. We're both uh, in fairly decent health. And we're now going to go out west uh, because there's opportunity for the two of us. What? What was the likeliness you and I were going to catch a disease at that time? <laughs> uh, a disease, very high. Um, you know, uh, it's it's a uh, you know when you read travel narratives from the time, uh, people just got sick all the time, and they, uh, you know, a lot of the time it was from you know bad water, um, you know, because they we didn't have. Uh, modern sanitation we didn't have you know you couldn't just put a a little um tablet in the water to uh you know sterilize sterilize everything um they didn't have chlorine and fluoride at the time they didn't have chlorine yeah they didn't have chlorine uh they didn't have chlorine tablets uh but also mosquitoes you know if a mosquito was carrying uh some disease you could get that um um it's um now, whether we would die from that disease is a different question, but sometimes people, you know, they would go on these, these massive journeys, they would get sick, they'd keep going, they were just miserable the whole time. Or if they couldn't move, they would lie, you know, they would stay in a tent or stay in a town uh, or a fort, and they would try to get their health back. And depending on the season, you know, you might have to wait all winter before <laughs> gas opens up, before the, you know, before the way becomes safe again, and then you can go. Okay. You know? Life was much well, life was much slower back then, so um, mm -hmm. this wouldn't have been. They weren't like lying in bed going, ah, you know, I could have been there by now. No, it's you're thinking, this journey already could take up to a year to do of my life, and so uh, step, you know, one step at a time. One step at a time. All right. Well, that's interesting. <clears throat> um, so if it was winter, you're gonna be 
basically stuck or not moving for however long winter and for how basically until the snow melted so if you went off course and ended up in the dakotas you're you're probably going to be stuck until next month <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and that's uh and that's if you were lucky uh you know depending on where you were you know th this was a, a you know we were talking about native americans earlier uh this was a time when you know being attacked by native americans on a trip was uh it was very real it was a very real danger uh, because to them, these were interlopers. These were people who were cutting through your lands, and you know, in pretty much any in pretty much any society uh, before the twentieth, twenty first centuries, if you you know trespass on someone's land, you know, someone's going to fire off a gun in the air and say, "Get, get lost, get yeah, uh, get out of here," um, because uh, you know you're you're on someone else's land. You're on you're you're you could be hunting somebody else's food you know that's that's theirs that's their food that's their land um and uh so people going on these trips you know they had to carry protection and uh they had to make sure that they knew where they were going because it was possible you know maybe someone had a, a treaty with a certain tribe that they would be left alone maybe that um someone could have made a deal with a with a certain members of a certain tribe to go through a specific part of territory that was also possible um, but, uh, you really had to know where you were going and that's why people, uh, they always hired guides. They always worked with people who had done the trip, who knew the way. And, uh, you know, like you would hire a guide for anything outdoorsy now, you know, just, uh, with, uh, but now this person also, you know, you entrusting this person with your life because, uh, knowing the right path could be the difference between life and death. Okay. So, um, is this like how like cowboys kind of got started because there were people that really <clears throat> knew how to travel through the land and understood the tribes? Well, uh, cowboys per se, um, that would be a little bit, that's a little bit different. Um, so at the time, you know, we were talking about how America was an agrarian society. Uh, one of the best use of big open tracts of land was for grazing cattle. And with cattle, you can sell milk, you can sell meat, you can sell uh, hides. And uh, that was a major form of wealth at the time. You know, in the South, you had cotton and sugar cane. Uh, in the North, you had factories. These are all stereotypes. Uh, and in the West, you had cattle. Um, and uh, that was the... So the people that had... People that herded cattle... Uh, those were the real cowboys. Like the idea of like the cowboy as being like a you know the lonesome lonesome dove uh, you know kind of gun gunslinger thing. It's they, those things kind of became conflated over time. A real cowboy was a guy that either owned a ranch, owned a bunch of cattle, and herded them and took care of them, uh, or was someone who worked for one of those cattle owners. And the um, having guns and being kind of like a gun shooting badass came from having to defend the uh, the herd, to defend, to defend the herd from wolves, uh, from cattle rustlers, people who just come in and steal them uh, for their own good, for their own, you know, use, processing, make money off of them uh, from Native Americans as well. Uh, so that that's kind of where the image, I think, of the cowboy really came from, is the guy that really does work with herds of cows you know he he herds cows essentially um but he needs weapons to uh keep it safe okay so was there like a separate name or uh kind of a separate name for the business of which people were these guides uh they would I, they went by a couple different names um uh, you know sometimes they uh they worked as a part of a company uh they could work just by themselves uh they set them because you you know if you put yourself in the position of someone who's living back then you know maybe you live in new york or boston or cincinnati or philadelphia you know you live in one of these bigger cities and you know you decide that you want to um you know buy some land out west or you want to go homestead some land out west but you know that it's very dangerous you've never seen it before and you actually don't know anybody that's seen it before but you've read about it and it seems exciting but it's very very scary and you know that you are in a, you're putting yourself in a position of life and death 
you're going to do your best to find someone who knows what to exp- who knows what is to expect, knows the right way to get there, and who can guide you and give you good advice on how to uh, how to do things there. You know, you the idea of just kind of going out on your own and trying to discover it on your own. Um, you could try to do that, but it would not be the smartest. Um, so these, you know, you call them scouts, you call them guides, um, but, uh, and it's possible that a lot of them, you know, came, you know, used to work with the United States military, you know, as a, as a scout, uh, as a ranger or something like that. Okay. So former rangers, um, former scouts would, uh, would be in this, in this, uh, business. Yeah, they could, they could be part of it. Um, it could be people that used to be trappers. Um, going out to uh, uh, trap beavers, his uh, pelts was a was a big business back then, and uh, you know maybe came back and decided they wanted to earn a little bit of money just guiding people to and from these same areas. Um, yeah, there was a lot of ways to uh, a lot of ways to make money back then, and uh, that was one of them. Okay, cool. So um, the thing that comes to mind, so the Revenant. I, I don't know if you've seen that movie. Yes, yes, I've seen it. Okay, so um, would you say that Leonardo DiCaprio's character was somewhere within that realm? <laughs> like he was, he was the kind of his character was the kind of person that got hired uh, to go take people out west or go take a company out west, make sure people were were safe. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, because you know these these guys, you know, they could also do both. You know, these guys could be, uh, you know, they could be a trapper on their own. And then sometimes they can say, you know, hey, I'll hire myself out as a as a guide, uh, as a scout uh, for other people if they're willing to pay me money. Um, you know, the realities of trying to live really haven't changed much since the dawn of human history. And we all need uh, we all need to somehow keep ourselves <laughs> alive. And whether that's through, you know, being a hunter gatherer, uh, being a farmer um exchanging services for money uh you know you you piece together things where you can you do things when you can uh so yeah that his character um would have been a good example of the type of person back then you know you've got the dumb dog leasing character saying we want i, be, I believe right he was his hit his uh there was a you know the, the the party of people that wanted to hire him to take him through a certain kind of yeah. part of the land right yeah uh so yeah yeah you would you would have found uh, plenty of guys like that then okay um now on the scale of realness in terms of things going wrong and bad stuff happening to you um i heard that philip glass was actually a real person um but on like a scale of one to ten how realistic would you say the kind of danger uh in the series of events things going wrong uh portrayal of the actual characters and places uh during the wild west uh would you rate something like that uh specifically the revenant yeah yeah so um uh, and i think his name was hugh glass the original hugh glass okay man. um he uh so you know it was based on it was based on his story but i think it was it was also on a book that was based on his story uh so there was a little bit of Every storyteller has to take some artistic license. Um, some of the bear facts are real, um, no pun intended, because there really was a bear attack. <laughs> the bear essentials, um, you know, uh, it was uh, it was pretty realistic in in in, in some respects. You know, um, dealing with the cold, uh, dealing with the dealing with being outside of civilization, where you have to um, you have to know survival skills to keep yourself warm, keep yourself fed, keep yourself sheltered. And keep yourself going. Those are all very real. Uh, being attacked by wild animals is definitely uh, a, a big deal. Um, my father-in-law, uh, he works as a guide in Montana for uh, people who want to do like elk hunting. So people will hire him during certain, you know, during hunting season, and he will take them. You know, he does this kind of stuff too. He takes them out where he knows the bears are, and he kind of sets everything up for them, and they get to shoot the elks or, or the antelopes or not antelopes no the, the uh, you know the they shoot they get the shooting prey. Yeah. Prey. yeah um and uh he runs into bears all the time you know he hasn't been attacked by one uh but he 
is, you know, he knows where they are. He knows um, kind of where to expect them and, uh, you know, how to uh, how to deal with them. So, you know, and so that's and that's the year 2023. So it's um, and what we have to keep, keep in mind, too, back then is that uh, America was teeming with wildlife. This was before, you know, the extermination of the buffalo. This was before there were millions of people inhabiting the American West. This is before all of that stuff. Before um, we started this, developing condos on every square inch. Before we started developing. <laughs> exactly. This like this was, you know, they 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 kept calling it the Garden of Eden. Like, the, you know, America, of course, was very Christian, very biblically, you know, they had a very biblical Christian mindset. And uh, they were always referring to the American West in these biblical terms. It's like the Garden of Eden. Uh, it was Edenic. There's this sense of this primal majesty that you couldn't get in the what you know the developed East, you know where you had roads, you had um, you know they start with they were starting to develop um, you know they had the Erie Canal was just being developed so that they could start moving things by water more quickly, steam engines they were developing the locomotive um, thing you know you had manicured lawns whereas you had this wild West, truly wild, full of animals. You know, you you look anywhere, and the you know the, the fish are leaping out of the water. You know, it's it, it's, it almost seems too easy. Um, and with all the prey that there is, there's also predators. So there was also lots of bears, lots of wolves, and um, and especially if you hadn't dealt with a bear before, you're in for a rude awakening. Especially grizzlies. Yeah, yeah. they're quite bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So the, so the, that movie's depiction of a lot of the dangers that. You could face in the wild west of that time were pretty pretty realistic i'm not sure about riding a horse off a cliff through the trees that part toward the end probably not so much um but also indian raiding parties uh you know that's that's how it was you know you're taking their stuff and uh you're kind of fair game and they're go for it back. yeah they'll fuck you yeah. up yeah they're gonna fight back <laughs> they're gonna fight back and uh, and all, but also too, you know, some societies. That's how they. That's how they work. You know, they 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 uh, they raiding is a part of their culture. Uh, you know, Comanches were like that. And if you go back into European history, you know, the Germanic tribes were like that. The Celts were like that. Uh, part of their society was we're going to go and we're going to steal these people's things. We're going to steal their women. We're going to steal their, uh, and and they're going to do it to us. And that's. That's how it works. Yeah. yeah. Um, so actually, since you were talking about biblical terms, um, there will be blood. That is... Uh, right. How, <clears throat> I, is that... Was that... Would you say something... Like, these were real things that were actually happening out west as well. Like, you suddenly start seeing um, people like Daniel day Lewis's kind of character coming in, taking over the area taking advantage of the area or making or just making a business of the area and you uh, had a lot of uh preachery uh, uh dan kano kind of characters bringing uh their their churches their pastures their philosophy into the area as well and having these two cultures clash uh yes i mean both both of those things did definitely exist at that time you know uh, so there will be blood took place um around the early 1900s uh early 20th century and you know that was also you know that was also based on a book uh oil by upton sinclair and uh you know like i said before sometimes things get either exaggerated or they become kind of things become symbols more than actual real things you know whether there was one person that actually was like daniel Day lewis's character i don't know for sure uh but that drive to that drive to basically buy up land drill it get the money making material out of the ground uh make yourself a millionaire compete with other people that capitalistic that naked capitalistic impulse um was a major part of the wild west um that that beyond the original kind of you know i gave you kind of an idealistic idea of 
people you know striking out and having their own land that they can build their own lives from was one part of it but the other part was that the west was full of resources to sell to get sell to others and make a profit off of and that was beaver pelts that was cattle that was silver gold and by the time of the late um, 19th century early 20th century uh, oil as well okay now well, historically um your examination what, what would what would uh you have added to those movies or altered with those movies from what was really going on or what really would have happened i think with the revenant i would have added a little bit more well first i would have actually said it where it took place because the the, the depiction of the geographical area was very odd uh, the, this stuff was happening in the kind of flat badlands of the Midwest. Uh, this wasn't happening in, you know, towering mountains and, you know, enormous primeval forests. You know, I get why they did that. I get why, you know, to the director did that because it's visually exciting. But the way they depicted it, you would have thought this took place in Colorado or Canada, but, but it took place in the American Midwest. Uh, it took place, I believe in the Dakotas, Nebraska, that kind of area. Uh, so it was a bleak, flat area. And the, uh, so I would have changed that if I wanted it to be more historically accurate. Um, and I think also with both of, with both of the stories, I would have, I would have included more humanity. I would have included more warmth. Because when all you see is suffering, when all you see is cruelty, you don't get a full picture of the human experience. And in the in the Wild West, there were there was lots of, you know, people got murdered, they stole from each other, they, they connived, they uh, manipulated, they left people for dead. All that stuff definitely happened. But also people fell in love. They got married, they had children, they had great friends, they built things with each other. And I think that that's one thing that many Westerns are missing is the gentle side of humanity that I think it, uh, it makes that other stuff stand out as, you know, with contrast and uh, shows that people are not just capable of cruelty because that's what the that's what a lot of westerns do they, you know they 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 in, with the films about the wild west they generally are you know if you take people out of civilization with police and laws and jail and you know legal consequences um what will they do and usually there's this idea that you know man fundamentally is this animal this murderous beast that once we're given you know you let us off the chain and we will stab everybody in the back and you know but i don't believe that because there are so many examples of especially in this 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 area back then that when there's no laws people made their own laws. people did not want to go and become savage animals in the middle of nowhere killing and eating each other. These people wanted to be safe. They wanted to be healthy. They wanted to be happy. Uh, and they, you know, in San Francisco, uh, around the time of the gold rush, uh, people didn't, uh, people didn't go there with the intention of it being like, you know, that part of Pinocchio where those all the, the boys and they're just going crazy and, you know, just chaos reigns. They didn't want that. Uh, so when there was arson and thievery going on and murders, they started what were called the vigilance committees. It was citizens coming together saying, we are going to make ourselves safe. We're going to hold people accountable and we're going to execute justice to make sure that people know there are laws. Um, I can't remember how I got on this tangent, but basically, you know, that that's part of the that was that was also part of the West is not just the darkness and the savagery being betrayed, like in The Revenant and going on this epic mission of revenge to, you know, kill Tom Hardy's character. And there will be blood, not just 
beating someone to death with a you know bowling with pin a, <laughs> with a bowling pin <clears throat> to symbolize the you know the victory of capitalism over whatever uh, you know it wasn't just that there was ambition there was cruelty but there was also uh, genuinely good people doing genuinely good human things okay so do you do you have an example of someone or like an incident or <laughs> Uh, well, the vigilance committees are a great example. Um, they're also a negative example. You know, like with everything, there's always you know a little bit of there's a little there's always a little bit of nuance. It, yeah, yeah, there's always there's always the you know the positive and negative. You know, there's someone that's you know you're gonna be vigilant. Somebody might turn you know vigilante a little bit. But let's right. let's talk about let's talk about those good things that we don't really those good things. In the media. Yeah. Uh, well, there's uh there's a collection of letters. Uh, that were written in the early 19 or early 1850s. Um, they're called the Dame Shirley Letters, and they were written by a woman who was a part of one of these early gold encampments in California during 18, I think 1850, 1851. And uh, they were autobiographical. They all came from her experience, but she wrote about them as if, you know, they were printed in local newspapers as if they were fiction. But um, this was a, a town called Rich Bar, uh, which is in Northern California. And it was a, you know, she, she came from the East. Her husband came from the East. Uh, her husband, uh, was a, a doctor, I believe. Um, and, you know, they wanted to make a little bit of money trying to find gold in the river in the, in the countryside. Um, uh, but they ended up forming this little society. They had a little hotel. They um, lived among all these other people from America, not just America, but also Chile. Um, there were Native American people who lived there as well. And you had this small town, which was kind of like, when you read it, it's like the opposite of the series Deadwood. Deadwood is, you know, people make the city in the middle of nowhere to find gold, but everyone is brawling and fighting and killing each other. This was very different. People came together to help each other. Um, when uh, when when someone got horribly injured, you know, the whole town would, you know, oh my God, we have to, we, let's let's go help him. And people would come and bring gifts. Um, they would um, send for help. They would cut people breaks. They would offer people, you know, you know, if you offer, if you help me with this, I'll help you with that. Um, you know, there, you know, she, she talks about uh, that's ex that's actually really sad moment she talks about this this time when this uh this young woman uh died and her you know they were having kind of a funeral for her and her body was lied out with a little kind of blanket over it and this woman writing the letters talked about how this woman's dead woman's daughter didn't quite understand what was going on and so she was running around and having fun and uh, you know, taking a little peek underneath the blanket at her dead mother's face, not quite understanding that she's dead. And she talks about just, you know, the, the, how, how sad the situation was and how it really deeply affected the whole community. Um, nothing, you know, there, there were plenty of good things that happened. Uh, you know, they would celebrate, they would celebrate New Year's, they would celebrate the 4th of July. Uh, and, and they would put on special dinners and they would dance and drink with everybody. Mm -hmm. And, and they so were also back. That, and so like the 4th of July at that time was a huge holiday. Like really? Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Especially in early America, because you're talking about people who were two generations away from the Revolutionary War. Uh, this, it was a big deal. You know, my grandparents didn't live in the United States. My grandparents lived in the British colonies. Uh, but we made a new country and by God, I'm going to celebrate it because it represents everything that we broke away from. You know, you read, uh, I have this, I have this great book called 40 years of American life. And it's an autobiography of a man who was born in the 1820s talking about his life in America in the middle of the century. And as a kid growing up, patriotism was a big thing. It was a big thing. It was, uh, you know, there were myths about the founding of America, um, because, you know, if you want a young country, a young country is going to be proud of itself. A young country is going to be immensely proud of itself, um, especially when there are people living who fought that war. 
you know, there are people still alive at this time who, you know, were at Yorktown. They were at the Battle of, you know, they were at the uh, the the, ba the Battle of New York. They were at the uh, you know, they 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 knew George Washington, you know. So um, yeah, so the Fourth of July was a was a very very big holiday. Yeah. All right. So getting back to before I interrupted you. So people, you know, uh, had they made elaborate feasts for the New Year for Fourth of July. Um, so these were pretty elaborate things. Like what else were like other, you know, big things that people did like at the end of the day when they were done working, like did someone get out of violin and they all did some square dancing? Like, so yeah, absolutely. Sometimes uh, it uh, depends on where you were. Some people wanted to mind their own business and just kind of, you know, write their letters, you know, uh, by candlelight. You know, letter writing was a big, uh, big thing back then. Uh, gambling was also a big thing. That's one thing that we haven't quite talked about yet. <laughs> how, how the, how the uh, gambling was one of the one of the biggest activities in the Wild West. Not, not only a reason to go west to find the gamblers that were betting big, and you know, be, uh, but also as just a way to pass time. Um, uh, you know, because, so yeah, so people they wrote, they played cards, uh, they read the Bible, they conversed with each other, because also, you know, if you're out in the fields all day, uh, mining or um, digging around, or, you know, you, you've probably been isolated for a good part of the day. So when you come back, that's your chance to catch up with your wife, to catch up with your friends, to catch up with your kids. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and if someone's got a fiddle, and there's a, there's a good occasion for it, then yeah, we'll have some dancing. It's, a, it's also a good way to to bring the community together people that may not hang out that much hey how's it going i haven't seen you for about a week uh yeah come, come on over uh you know that's um uh, it was a way to preserve community is to have these 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 get-togethers at the end of the day yeah so also with the work before we get into gambling um with work so people so people were surprisingly spending a lot of time isolated with, with work like you would go out into your work <clears throat> and be interacting with somebody for a good chunk of the day or a portion of the day yeah if you if you think about the type of work people were doing in the west uh you know if if you have um if you have a farm or a ranch uh or if you have a a, a mining claim um you have your own property there's tons to do there's tons to do there's you know you make a fence or you're out trying to find a lost goat or you're digging up the earth and sifting through it to see if there's any precious metals in there. And uh, in, uh, in, in many cases, that could be a very lonesome activity um, because, uh, you know, if you're a part of a company of people or if you are out there with your family, then your family's not all doing the same thing necessarily. You know, the, the, the wife of the family is probably doing what we considered women's work uh, mending or sewing, cleaning clothes, uh, making butter, cooking. Uh, uh, you know, she could also be doing some traditionally manly activities like chopping wood, you know, because it was kind of all hands on deck at the time. Um, so unless your work brought you in close proximity with uh, whoever you're living with, uh, yeah, you could be spending a lot of time alone. Okay. All right, so a lot of isolation. That's why these social activities were so big. Um, now, speaking of social activities, we're talking a little bit about gambling. Fill me in on why this was so huge. Is this why we have casino? Like, is this why casinos are big in America? Uh, well, d definitely the iconography of the uh, American casino comes a lot from the Wild West. Um, gambling, uh, gambling was one of the only really <laughs> serious ways to make lots of money. Uh, one one thing that really surprised me uh reading about the gold rush uh the california gold rush was that in these gold rush mining towns the people making the most money were the gamblers not the miners so if you went out there and you were sifting looking for gold and stuff most people didn't really find much they either broke even or they actually lost money on the whole trip and they had to go back home the people that were making tons and tons of money were gamblers uh and some of these people, they were spending $10,000 a month on a hotel room in, you know, San Francisco or Sacramento City. And they were, you know, they would 
they would post up and be like, all right, I'm here to gamble and that's what I'm going to do. And when I'm done, I'm going to move to the next town. That's what they did. And that's how they made their money. Um, it was, uh, it was a huge activity. Gambling has always been a part of human society. Um, but, but in the West is where a lot of our images of American gambling really come from. Okay. All right. So, um, is there anything else you would like to share, Philip? Um, just that I think, um, I think there are so many stories still to be told about the Wild West. And I think that I used to be a kind of, I used to be the kind of person that wasn't really interested in this stuff. I thought it was, again, I thought it was just cow guns and cowboys and Indians and seen it, been there, done that. But when I started reading about it, when I started learning about it, and I realized just the the wealth of stories, the wealth of perspectives, the types of people that came and, and went, the types of things that they did, um, it just made me realize that there's so much more in this huge period of American history that uh, deserves to be read about. And I hope that everybody um, goes out and goes out and checks out more about it. All right. Anything else you'd like to share with future generations? <laughs> well, to the to to our progeny, to the people of the future, um, languages can change, cultures can change, circumstances can change, but fundamental human needs and desires are the same from century to century. All right. Thank you, Philip. Thank you very much.